content creation is really at a great place right now, from start to finish, really. But today, we're going to talk about the start and just how far cameras have come. With all of the power and the capabilities of their higher-end cameras in a sleek and very just travel-friendly design, Sony might have actually created one of the best options for budding content creators or creators on the go. Hey, it's Joshua Vergara. What's going on, everybody? Here's what worked and what didn't with this here Sony ZV-E1. So Sony lent me this ZV-E1 to try for a few weeks and to make some content on, but as you might expect, I spent way more time actually using this camera rather than actually filming it for B-roll for this video. In keeping with the ZV lineup, uh, the body doesn't actually have a more traditional look and feel like many other A-series cameras or really most other cameras. Instead, this body takes a lot of the design language originally introduced in the A7C and brings the ZV philosophy to it. And that means a few different things. For one thing, that means less physical controls. I'll talk more about that in a bit, but there are also a bunch of tools in here that are specially made for easing the workload for solo shooters. The three inch flip out screen is nice and bright while being properly responsive as a touch screen, which is important given that many of the controls you might have on the actual body of the camera are now in this touch screen interface that has all of the operational shortcuts. There are still all the bits of information on the viewfinder that any creator might need, but it's easy enough to go to auto or to a mode like aperture priority to get good video with less fuss. Case in point, the key ZV features like background defocus or product showcase modes. And since this full frame sensor here in the ZV E1 uh, has the enhanced autofocusing system that was found in more recent A7 cameras, the product showcase mode is actually super responsive and takes some of the guesswork out of making sure the autofocus points are in the right place. There are other features on here for budding vloggers like a skin softening feature that I pretty much never used, and then an auto framing feature that crops into the frame and emulates movements that someone behind the camera might make. But if it's just you all by your lonesome, this is kind of a nice way to keep yourself in frame and in focus with the face and eye detection on as well. Features like this help make the ZV lineup a great place to start for anyone that wants the high quality possibilities that full frame cameras provide, but maybe with like a lower learning curve. Or maybe you already know your way around a camera, but you just want something a little bit different, maybe keep things a little bit simpler. A bit of laziness never hurt anyone as long as you still get the shot. But for those who already know their way around cameras, the ZV E1 might actually feel like a a bit of a step back. Now, first off, the streamlined controls of the E1 make it feel somewhat foreign to anyone that's used to like a larger body with more dials or more buttons. That's certainly something I had to contend with at first since I prefer all of my dials and buttons that are easily accessible around the grip. Speaking of which, the grip is quite a bit thinner than typical bodies might provide, introducing hand cramps from time to time when I was shooting for extended periods. I'd personally want to put a cage on this camera just to make up for that grip and to make it just a little bit more comfortable. But like I said before, all of the controls are either relegated to just what can fit on the actual camera itself or to all of these touchscreen controls. That just means there's a bit more fiddling that is required when changing settings like the shutter speed or the ISO, and you're pretty much always trying to use this particular wheel or the one dial that's up here for aperture. Basically, I always feel like I'm hitting a couple more buttons to change things up compared to my other cameras that I use, and that's just not the best when it comes to what I want in terms of ergonomics. As we're talking about this grip, uh, I do want to give you one quick tip that really helped me out as far as actually using this thing regularly. There is a bit of a thumb rest over here in the corner that you can use, but it's like you're pinching this one small area here on the camera. But if you pop out the screen just a little bit, this indentation at the top of the camera that you would use to actually pop the screen out can actually serve as a thumb rest. So you might need to have the screen out just a little bit to achieve that, but at least uh, you can have this little life hack make life just a tiny bit easier when using this thing regularly. And finally, there is the matter of having no EVF. I know this is a bit of a polarizing feature. Uh, this is still something that I kind of go back and forth forth on, because I am indeed a videographer first and foremost, and an EVF is usually more useful for photographers. On my other cameras, I do still like to get up close and personal with the viewfinder, especially for like handheld shots like this. Thankfully, adjusting to just having the larger flip out screen for everything wasn't too difficult, but if you're a stickler for that more traditional method of shooting, well, it's still something to consider. One of the reasons why I would always want to have an EVF is because getting up close and personal with it often helped to stabilize certain shots, especially when I'm just using the camera with one hand. And the stabilization on Sony cameras has always been a bit of a hit or miss for me. For the most part, my other Sony cameras like the a7 IV have had good stabilization, but it's the roll that is the only part of the axes that didn't seem totally addressed. With the ZV-E1, however, that dynamic active stabilization adds another layer to the existing active mode with software enhancements. The result is actually some 
some of the best stabilization that I've seen on a camera, but it comes at a small but significant cost. Dynamic Active introduces a heavier crop, meaning that using my widest lenses became much more imperative for shots in vlogs or just handheld B-roll. You can see in these clips that from an outstretched arm, the wide end of my 16 to 28 millimeter lens looks very different as we go up the stabilization levels. It's not a huge deal and actually made it so that I can use that one lens for most of my footage over the last few weeks, but it's still a trade-off that had to be made in order to achieve what I would consider pretty great stabilization. I say that this is a feature that definitely worked because it is great, but I just want to make sure that I mention what was required in order to achieve it. After all, it's a real feat for that kind of stabilization to be possible on a full frame sensor that's packed into a small body like this. That is a bit of the wow factor of the ZV-E1, the fact that you get so much of what the a7S III and now the a7V have provided, but in a design that is, in a way, less complicated, definitely smaller, and less cumbersome to handle. And the footage does back all of that up. I actually kept things pretty simple with my 4K video capture across multiple videos that I've shot over the last few weeks. I didn't even get into all of these picture profiles to mess around with things like S-Log or even the added S-Cinetone. Cinetone does look pretty great out of the camera despite leaving room for some color grading, but as a simpler YouTuber, <laughs> I prefer to have the footage dialed in body rather than having to do more work in post. So with that, I did stick with standard color and did very little saturation boosting in post only if I felt like it was actually needed. But nonetheless, all of the footage came out nice and crisp, supported by the great stabilization, and performing just the way I needed given my standing experience with the settings that I would want. I could have just as easily gotten many of the shots that you're seeing right now with the added convenience modes, but the point of the ZV-E1 is that you can do either methodology and the high quality full frame sensor will do the rest. Now, if I wanted to get sweatier with shooting, I'd be able to push the limits of this by taking advantage of dual native ISOs. I'd put the super high bitrate all intra codecs as my setting, and I'd put my own LUT in here to see in real time through the flip out screen. And finally, I could push for slow motion capture via the S and Q mode. What's crazy is that this camera is just getting started. Soon there's going to be an update that allows for this camera to get 4K 120 frames per second long gop footage. That's pretty insane considering that this is a smaller full frame camera than Sony's original king of 120 FPS, the a7S III. So on a fundamental level, the same quality that you would expect from those other cameras has just been shrunken down to make this one of the most travel friendly and maybe even beginner friendly full frame cameras available right now, which is pretty nuts. But that's on the fundamental side, which means that there are some compromises that had to be made in order to make this camera a reality. I already talked about the controls and the lack of an EVF, but there is the matter of how a smaller body like this handles something like overheating. An hour of getting a 64 gigabyte card worth of B-roll did make the camera get warm to the touch, and I do make sure that I have this auto power off temperature setting set to high. Now to be clear, I have yet to make this camera overheat or actually shut off during any of my content capture, and that's great. But for anyone that's looking to go super long with 4K recording, the body can get pretty warm under particular load. And if you really push those limits, maybe you'll get that overheating warning and then the camera will shut off. That's what happens when you just have a smaller, tighter design. The same goes for all of the ports. The ZV-E1 sports just one SD card slot, and you'll need some huge high-speed cards to keep up with, especially the higher bitrate all-eye recordings. There are mic and headphones jacks here, uh, which is good, but the mini HDMI port might pose a bit of a problem, especially if you have broken a couple of these ports in the past. Obviously, I use a three camera setup here with a monitor connected to all of them, and having to adapt to a mini HDMI port is just a little bit of a nuisance. Now, live streamers might have to consider that, though Sony does allow for the camera to be seen as a webcam when connected through the USB-C port to a computer. Overall, what some creators might want out of their cameras comes as a bit of a mixed bag in the ZV-E1, so it's important to know exactly what you might be comfortable with before swinging for the ZV fences here. What I really have to give Sony credit for is how far they've come with accessory and lens offerings. Sony cameras are among the most supported by both first and third parties when it comes to different lenses and tools for their cameras. And since the ZV-E1 is an E-mount camera, you have so much to choose from in terms of glass. I've already mentioned that I've been using the Sigma 16-28 f2.8 on here the most. And let's not forget about the various G Master lenses that can actually take your footage to the next level, if you can stomach the price and are really going for those looks, of course. The same goes for Sony's own audio offerings. This onboard mic is pretty decent with some features to make sure it sounds okay, but their hot shoe shotgun mic uh, is among one of my favorite easy accessories in all of camera audio. This is what standard stabilization looks like. I like to think that I have some pretty steady hands and also the ZV-E1, even with the Sigma lens, is actually pretty light. Uh, but yeah, you can get a little bit of those wobbles still, even in the standard stabilization. Active comes in just a little bit, but the dynamic active, that's where the best stabilization comes 
comes in and it's just, it's really good. I have to admit, it is pretty good. Here's a great example. I'm walking around right now just holding the lens, uh, my Sigma lens right now, uh, and it's really stable. Here's the thing though, I'm using this at 16 millimeters. Seriously, a combination like this right here is the reason why I ended up adding Sony cameras as an option for all of my work. And that's where I think the ZV-E1 might be one of the most interesting, but also one of the most confusing cameras to come out in a while. It's certainly one of the most capable, and it has been a joy to use so far. But the ZV lineup is technically made for those who are a bit newer to the world of content creation, and they want something pretty easy to start. The ZV-E1 then is somehow right in the middle as a camera that tries to support the beginner but also supports experienced shooters who want something more travel friendly or a secondary camera to their existing Sony kit. After a couple of weeks with this camera, I've seen plenty of my peers pick up the ZV-E1 as it seemed the easy choice for anyone even remotely familiar with cameras or content creation. But would I recommend it to everyone? I do think I would, if not for just one part of the equation the price. This is the most full-featured ZV camera, and that also makes it just as expensive as many of the other cameras that creators like me might have their eyes on to begin with. Cameras like what I'm literally using right now, the Sony a7 IV or the Panasonic S5 II, both of which bring a lot of the same fundamental capabilities at the same or even slightly lower prices. Sure, Sony really ups the ante with AI features and enhanced stabilization, but if you're just starting out in the world of video, the ZV-E1 might still be a pretty steep ask. Even this kit alone, that I think most people would benefit from, and what I've really enjoyed traveling with lately, this carries with it so many added costs. The Sigma 16-28 f2.8 lens and then the Sony shotgun mic here, together, they raise the price another like $1,300 from the ZV-E1 body only. And the ZV-E1 body only is at a price of around $2,200. No matter if you're just starting out or not, this is still a lot of investment. I have to put down the caveat that it is a lot of money to spend and it frames the ZV-E1 not quite as the go-to starter kit, but rather as the, let's say, dream or aspirational starter kit. The ZV-E1 has so much going for it, and if you can get it, I absolutely think it's one of the best video content creation tools out there. I would just say don't get too caught up like me in what we call GAS, G-A-S, or gear acquisition syndrome. That's honestly rich of me to say because I'm going to probably buy a ZV-E1. But then again, it's not my first camera. Did you get hyped for the Sony ZV-E1 and did you get one? Let me know what your time with it has been like so far and if the E1 is your first camera especially, let me know in the comments down below. Drop some likes for more camera content like this and subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. From there though, I'm gonna go ahead and call it on this one. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Please take care of yourselves and each other and enjoy your tea everybody.